So it's my pleasure to welcome Shetil Ramatwet to, um, to our get together today. And um, Shetil, who's an associate professor at the Center for the Study of the Science and the Humanities, is somebody I've had the pleasure of uh, working with on uh, some issues tangential to what he's going to talk about today. The talk today is based on a paper titled Make Way for the Robots, Human and Machine Centricity in Constituting a European Public-Private Partnership. And in this, Shetil brings up in, in a journal called Minerva, both human and machine-centric approaches to the promotion of agendas of digitalization of innovation in Europe. And I think he will uh, bring us around to some reflections on energy transitions in Norway as well, which is one of his interests. And uh, then we can get into a discussion afterwards. So Shetil, over to you. Thank you, Sid. Um, I'm first going to try to share my screen. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so now you see my screen, right? Okay, so then um, I'll just start. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sid, for the for the invitation to to join your uh, your seminar. Uh, very happy to be here. As uh, I think you have already presented the paper, uh, or at least uh, the the name of it. So I I could uh, I think I should just start right away. Um, the it my the paper comes out of um, of a three year study uh, within a project called Epinet that I uh, I was the was the project coordinator and also originator of, of the project uh, where we also studied um, uh, electrical grids smart grids uh, and and wearable sensors on the body so so this was one out of actually four. Uh, technologies that that we studied through throughout three years. It's based on a uh, it's based on a mapping of uh, some main networks involved in the innovation of and around robotics uh, in Europe. So uh, it devotes a lot of attention to industry, to robotic science, to law and ethics, but also to 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 some extent. To politics and the institutions to see to map some of the ways in which um, these these networks of industry of robotics of law increasingly uh, make themselves relevant and have a, a, an influence also on political agendas about for the future of of Europe and I think we can see similar things also in Norway and in many other countries. Uh, so methodologically, I'm not going to say a lot about how we how we performed our study, but uh, it's based on on a, a mapping and a analysis of strategic documents, um, uh, discourse analysis of strategic documents. We also carried out participant observations in some main robotics events, and we carried out a two day workshop that focused on the meanings and problems of robotic autonomy, uh, where we involved participants from the various networks that are dealt with in, in this paper. So uh, robotic science, industry, law and ethics. Um, we talk in the paper, I'm, I'm not gonna go a lot into the theoretical part. It comes mainly out of the field called science and technology studies and uh, maybe a special emphasis on a concept of um, co-production, which basically means uh, that there is some kind of interconnection between societal problems and the ways in which uh, scientific and technological problems are defined and shaped. So in order to address this for, for the robotics uh, case in Europe, we, we um, proposed uh, a concept of techno epistemic network and basically the the um, the characteristic of this network uh, is how it is mobilizing traditional sources of knowledge so different kinds of sciences to innovate for a societal purpose so in this case it is to bring um, 
more intelligent, uh, socially uh, active robots into society. That is the common denominator of, of, the, um, of the actors that we study. So that, that is to us enough to say that we are dealing here with a network that is increasingly also organized. So we are looking at an increasingly organized, coordinated uh, set of activities um, and, and, and we use this, uh, this concept of the, of the techno-epistemic network to, to capture some of this. We also talk about the socio-technical imaginary of autonomous robots for society. So, so how future visions of society are be, being imagined through these robotics networks. But as I said, I will, I will spare you uh, most of the uh, conceptual details. But, but, uh, but what the paper then deals with is how this, this vision or imaginary of, of a future robotic society where robots are increasingly taking over uh, a number of important human and societal tasks is uh, becoming um, implemented and enacted within different kinds of, let's call them practices, so the different practices of industry, of science, and then especially the science of robotics. Uh, within law, to some extent, ethics is also relevant, although we don't talk about that much in this paper. But both law and ethics are, of course, important for articulating um, the underlying normative rationale, uh, which exists in uh, all European legal constitutions, that uh, that human dignity and autonomy is to be respected, and that also goes very. That this becomes, as we shall see, a main important theme in this field. And then finally, we also deal to some extent with politics, uh, and as I said, the ways in which um, uh, some of these networks have impacts on on um, political agendas, and as we shall see, also how how it came about that the European Parliament came to um, actually seriously discuss a proposal to give a legal personhood to, to robots, to artificial intelligences. Okay. Uh, so Sid mentioned that there is some overlaps here with, with uh, energy transitions as maybe that is more uh, of a topic of, of um, of interest to this forum. Um, I mean, first of all, it's it, it may not be that obvious, but, but it's quite clear that uh, if you think about energy systems and especially energy systems that are supposed to become smart, uh, they can be seen as large robotic systems. If you define uh, a robotic system uh, broadly, it has, uh, so the smart grid has sensing capacities. It has to some extent thinking capacities, and it has to some extent acting capabilities. So in this sense, uh, you could say that energy systems fall within what we are talking about here, although that is a bit of a stretch. Um, but, but perhaps more to the point, um, there are, as I said, we did study uh, alongside the, the robotics case study, we also studied um, similar networks engaged with energy transitions and the smart grid uh, transition in, in Europe. And you see something similar that innovation and digitalization is becoming increasingly um, involved in addressing major societal and ecological problems. So, so wherever there is a problem, you can almost count on there being um, a digital technology to address it. But it's also about the ways in which uh, digital technologies are increasingly involved in organized, complex, and large-scale uh, projects towards some kind of societal reform and societal innovation. And a lot of this uh, around here happens at the European level, although, of course, it also happens at national levels. And, and there is increasingly the, the tight squeeze, the geopolitical competition, uh, in which Europe finds itself where, where there is uh, the US on the one hand, very strong in digital technologies and China coming up very strongly on the other hand. So, so robotics is one of these cases where traditionally Europe has a strong base, 
but but during the case studies that we carried out there were for instance some major european companies that went uh they didn't go bankrupt but they were actually sold to to asian companies and this caused major concern uh amongst the european elites so now today we have a concept of technological sovereignty and strategic autonomy that is becoming increasingly articulated by european policymakers finally we see how uh, regulatory and democratic concepts such as autonomy and legal and ethical concepts autonomy democratic participation sustainability and so on become caught up in very large scale processes and very uh, complex innovation networks so we may pose the question do these concepts these regulatory approaches which are also supposed to have uh, democratic meaning and, and meaning to, to uh, a broader audience, a broader public, broader communities, do they still carry meaning and have social resonance also with, with these publics and these communities? Or are they mainly um, enacted within expert innovation networks? Okay, so uh, what we see here in this um, or in our paper, we, we start out by uh, describing the increasing uh, and some of the historical background of the increasing institutionalization of robotics at the European level. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, we don't provide the full story of that, and I cannot recapture much of it here, but important moments include the making of a technology platform in 2005, so that means uh, that that uh, research and innovation activities uh, became increasingly centralized and manifest embedded at the European level, but still mainly as, a, as an isolated technology domain. Then in 2014, uh, the industry, because they are, as we will see, the, the main drivers behind developments, um, they entered into a public-private partnership with the European Commission and with the European institutions, uh, which is a kind of a deeper embedding within, within the institutions, as we shall see. So uh, also coming with certain duties for, for public institutions to, to buy the products of, uh, of robotics innovation, to use them, and, and also some other things. We will return to that. Uh, we also see that um, these developments, because, because robotics innovation, the, the underlying assumptions and many of the underlying imaginations that, that were enacted by the, by the robotics industry were machine centric. And so in this sense, they, they have uh, clashed with, with the human centric um, approach taken by legal constitutions. And this also became a big topic uh, at the European level. And we have seen this play into the continuation of the, the developments that we are describing here, uh, predominantly in, in the form of, of a package for artificial intelligence for, U for Europe, a, a policy package and also an innovation, also a large innovation field that uh, overlaps with robotics to large extents. Uh, but in the in the case of artificial intelligence, uh, there is now an explicitly human centric approach being taken. But but as we as we will see here, that was not always the case. Okay, so uh, I will go into the main body of the paper, which describes, um, and this is also how we how we started uh, our research. We noticed. Uh, with uh, with some interest that that both roboticists, so um, scientists within the field of robotics, which is also very uh, composite, interdisciplinary, heterogeneous field, is many it consists of many disciplines. Uh, they would talk about robotic autonomy. Uh, at the same time, you you could listen to ethicists and lawyers who would also talk about robotic autonomy. And then uh, looking a bit more into the issue, we also saw that industry also had uh, an opinion on, on autonomy. So um, this kind of triggered our, 
our curiosity and we wanted to see, uh, do they really talk about the same thing? Is autonomy the same thing here? Me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a philosopher, uh, so I know uh, the concept of autonomy uh, very well. It has a long history in, in um, European and Western, especially um, political, uh, political uh, history and, uh, and, and central to main political ideas. But, but what, what do the roboticists and what, what does the industry mean when they talk about uh, autonomy? Okay, so first, um, the, the description of industry, um, the industry part of this network. What we see here is, uh, is kind of a transition from one, uh, of course, par paradigmatic or idealized image of what a, robo a robot is. So traditionally in, in the popular imagination, um, but also in the ways in which it has functioned, at least since the 70s, when we had industrial robotics in Europe and, and elsewhere, the image of, is of a machine situated inside a factory on a shop floor, and it's, it's uh, bolted to the floor. It's, it cannot move uh, from, from the space where, to which it is attached. It can move within a three-dimensional space, um, but, but only in order to perform very limited operations, such as drilling, bolting, painting, uh, moving parts, assembling things, and so on. But then, uh, so that is on the left side of this, uh, of this um, uh, image. Then moving to the, to the, to the right, you have uh, the question, uh, I mean, the listeners may ask themselves, would you, would, you, um, would you like to give the responsibility for caring for your grandmother to a robot? Uh, we increasingly see that care, tasks of care and companionship are taken over by, by some kind of robotic-like uh, applications. Uh, and of course, we also have the self-driving cars, uh, which is maybe even more pronounced in, in media stories and so on, where, where, um, where they develop a kind of uh, awareness, the, the, the cars develop an awareness of the surrounding environment and they become capable or not so capable actually of maneuvering traffic systems. I'm still not convinced that, that this will uh, happen in the, with the existing traffic systems, but, uh, but something will probably come out of it. Uh, so, so there you have a kind of paradigmatic shift uh, so a strategic document from 2009 states how, with increased flexibility and ease of use, robots are at the dawn of a new era, turning them into ubiquitous helpers to improve our quality of life by delivering efficient services in our homes, offices, and public spaces. And, and perhaps the main underlying technology enabling this is machine learning, right? Artificial intelligence, where, where machines, to some extent, become capable of not simply mechanically applying rules, but also to some extent to learn from previous experience or learn from the experiences of other machines communicated to them through networks. Um, so within, within this uh, um, industry strategy, we see that there is, there is as I said, um, an imagined robotic autonomy that is being implemented in very strategic ways, very systematic ways. Um, it, is, uh, it performs a kind of vision where, uh, well, I can just read out the definition that they provided in 2009. It hasn't changed much uh, through the last 10 years or so. Autonomy, autonomy is the system's ability to independently perform a task, a process or system adjustment. The level of autonomy can be assessed by defining the necessary degree of human intervention. So uh, they look at autonomy in a, in a quite broad sense and they define it as an increasing delegation of tasks, of human tasks, of traditional human tasks to the machines. 
Um, it's also quite important, and we spent quite some uh, time um, to uh, to study the strategic reasoning underlying this vision. Where, because most machines, they they do not have these capacities now. To some extent, limited extent, they do, but. But mostly, if you look at some of the visions that are out there of smart societies of sm and smart robots, self-driving cars and, and, and machines taking care of a grandmother and so on, uh, they, they fall short of those visions. So th there is all this promise out there, but, but not necessarily uh, the, real, the real applications to fulfill those promises. So an industry is kind of, they are, are aware of that. And so much of the work that they are doing in these strategic documents that they, that they have published every five years or so is to, they see progress towards some kind of robotic society as, a, as gradual improvements, very, very pragmatic on existing technology. So they try to take what is there and they try to put it together and, and, and this is a very systematic effort. So they identify gaps to be filled. Uh, in 2009, they had, uh, there was a technical report outlining 66 different um, uh, technological gaps. Uh, you can see here down to the right, the name of some of them, 3D mapping, multi-robot, simultaneous localization and mapping, the, that's the SLAM system modeling of human robot interaction and, and so on. So these could these are the, these are examples of some of the gaps uh, identified by the industry. And that means they had to mobilize resources towards that end, of course. So trying to address the gaps then becomes the way forward. Um, for this purpose, uh, they they increasingly mobilize academic researchers, roboticists, Traditionally, there has been uh, something of a divide between academic robotics and industrial robotics. So, so um, academic um, robotics being more curiosity driven, independent and so on. Uh, industry more strategic perhaps, but they also all, always had uh, engagements between them. So it's a bit of a tense relation there but they are always engaged in these efforts to overcome um, the, the barriers or um, to, towards uh, closer collaboration between academic roboticists and, and industrial roboticists. And they also see that increasingly they need to collaborate with lawyers um, and ethicists and social sciences. Uh, we were engaged with a huge um, robotics research team where they also um, employed a number of social psychologists to try to understand people's fears of machines. Uh, the fear of, of machines go, go quite some time back, at least in Western society, back to the Luddites who, who were, that was something like a movement who would attack uh, factory machines because, because uh, they were taking their jobs. So, so there is this need to mobilize law. And, and, and of course, if you release cars into the traffic system, or if you're to introduce drones into business operations like delivery, uh, deliveries of goods at home, or if you're going to have uh, machines caring for the elderly, uh, you, you cannot do it without the, the issue of liability uh, being somehow addressed in a reassuring way. What happens when something goes wrong? Who is responsible uh, in these extremely uh, composite complex networks of different actors? So all of this means that uh, the industry, they are very, um, they were very, they are very aware that they need to create a kind of community or a network. So they are the main network creators. They are very instrumental in creating a shared language uh, where autonomy also figures, they uh, they have events, they have uh, a lot of project funding. Of course, a lot of the project funding at the European level increasingly goes uh, through industry or 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 industry either funds it directly or they they define the goals of research. So they are very aware that they need to build this robotics community. They have uh, emailing lists. They have. Uh, robot competitions also to 
show the robots to to uh, the public and so on and they they early on proposed the making of a, the creation of a private public partnership um well actually it's called a public private partnership so i have rebranded it a private public partnership but that, that must have been a slip of a slip of the tongue but but in those cases it means that the public systems also commit to some kind of pre-commercial procurement that that when industry has developed the product that that the public is also somehow um obliged or committed to to using and buying the products okay so let's go on to um the robotics science network or or the sign the practice of science so they they also relate to the same agenda as established by industry by and large but they do so in different ways they have a different knowledge base and they also identify more as as um, a kind of um, well independent researchers as 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 many researchers think of themselves as in, as indeed independently pursuing their research interests right so they may be quite different from from the interest of industry after all uh, robotics research can even be quite philosophical because it it poses basic questions about the constitution of of nature of how mechanical things move what are the relations between living things and non-living things robots they enter into this uh, kind of philosophical space and can be used actually as a kind of experimental prototype so there is this fascination with things that are moving uh, thinking perceiving almost like a human almost like godlike you can almost create uh, uh, another person well not the person but 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 you create a machine that looks like a person so here there is something of a different attitude perhaps um also the in in strategic documents that we were studying we see that they criticized the incre incremental approach taken by industry they thought industry was way too conservative and they said if you if we're going to have a robotic society based on putting to together the existing technologies based on what we have now is going to lead it's likely to lead to a gradual loss of controllability and robustness and this will ultimately lead to a substantial cost inefficiency and safety so uh, the roboticists that we followed this was uh, by the way a huge um uh, an effort towards uh, um, the making of a huge kind of excellence project in europe it brought together many of the main leading roboticists in a project called Ro Robot Companions for Citizens. Uh, so, so what I'm describing here is, um, is what we experienced in this, in this project. So the, the Robot Companions for Citizens, they, they proposed a kind of excellence-oriented scientific strategy to overcome gaps by building the bridges to the machines of tomorrow. They call this the challenge of enablement. How can you enable the machines? to become more socially sentient, more intelligent, more interactive, more aware of their, of their surroundings. They said um, that the whole new class of machines, uh, we, we need a whole new class of machines to overcome the limitations of today's machines, new machines based on a whole new science. So this was their underlying vision that, that a kind of paradigmatic leap was needed not the incremental approach taken by by industry um, so in order to do this they they went to biology and to evolution for inspiration they looked at how um, how sentient beings have evolved through history through through evolution and they thought they would try to study and and copy some of the adaptive mechanisms of, of uh, different kinds of beings at different levels of, um, of the evolutionary ladder. So, and, and then they proposed to turn these principles of evolution into a kind of technological principle that, that would be able to cognitively guide the robots, uh, calling uh, it the ability to integrate across perception, affect cognition and action 
in order to construct one coherent scene and context in which action can be interpreted, planned, generated, and communicated. That's, that was part of their, of their vision. And for this purpose, they, they employed both cognitive scientists, neuroscientists, people working in ICTs, material science, uh, electrical engineers, roboticists of various flavors, uh, and also uh, a few philosophers. And as I mentioned earlier, social psychologists and lawyers. So the, again, a hugely complex um, machinery. Um, okay, so that was, that was kind of a, a snapshot into, into some of the, um, of the academic networks trying to implement um, sentient robots. Then uh, we turn to the legal networks that are increasingly also shaping along with the uh, industry and, and the scientific effort. So increasingly, this is what we mean by, uh, or this is one meaning of the concept of co-production. They are increasingly trying to align each, to each other. They are trying to adapt um, to each other so, so that the legal, uh, legal expert, necessary legal expertise is brought within the innovation network so as to be able to, to uh, meet some of the legal and, and social and ethical challenges that are facing this kind of innovation. So uh, the industry, they in their in a strategic green paper that was meant as a preparation for a, um, a legislative document at the European level, um, they identified or they, they stated that the role of law is to identify obstacles hindering the development of robotics with a specific focus on service robots. Uh, and they proposed a road mapping effort conducted in e-robotics. That, um, that, that was the technology platform, the industry platform at the time on ethical, legal and societal issues deterring the development of uh, robotics in Europe. So what you are seeing is the preparation for breaking down the boundaries between industrial robotics, academic robotics and society, where society increasingly becomes a kind of factory um, where people increasingly interact with, with, the, with the robots. And for this purpose, there is a need to address these uh, legal issues amongst which uh, human centricity, autonomy, uh, and so on uh, is, is a central one. So, so these legal issues were identified by the robotics network as barriers or obstacles to what they want to achieve. Uh, yeah, so this is the, um, this is this, uh, this is the front page uh, for the suggestion for a green paper on legal issues in robotics. It was led by people, it's from 2010, 2011. No, I think it was published in 2012, actually, yeah. Uh, it was led by people from industry, but it was employing uh, people from law, lawyers and, and ethicists mainly, and also some social scientists. So we interacted with some of these people and we discussed with them, what do they mean by autonomy and, and so on. Um, but, but to large extents, um, well, first of all, they, they confirmed our, our suspicion that what they mean by autonomy is very different from what industry means or, or from what the uh, robotic science mean by the concept. But the main problem that they had to address was based in, in very basic assumptions of our existing legal systems. So uh, Western legal constitutions are based on a division between legal subjects. I mean, that is human beings like us, uh, having uh, having some kind of agency and and legal objects which are understood as physical entities. So there is a kind of dualism here, subject object. But this is the way it has been understood for for things have been understood for centuries. So, but this means that the the the, um, the robotics industry comes up against these uh, these uh, constitutional. Um, constructs or divisions or concepts uh, and seeing them as a, as a kind of hindrance to innovation. 
so the main the main issues here were identified in this in this document as pertaining to intellectual property rights who will have who will have um, the rights of uh, of some of uh, data that has been collected by by robots for instance i mean that is one funny problem that you run into non contractual liability what happens when the robot causes damage so this is the major one uh, which we also concentrated on uh, and and how can you think about some kind of personhood that is of course very related to the idea of liability should there be some kind of personhood granted to them to the robots so this was um, then the proposal coming out of this green paper they proposed an electronic personhood where which was a limited capacity of robots to to have some some responsibility it was mainly attached to an economic fund where all of the people who had produced sold and used the robot had to pay into the fund so that there could be some kind of economic compensation uh, in in case of um, of uh, damage caused by the machine and in many cases when when the machine become machine becomes capable of learning uh, and of, of uh, operating in unstructured environments, you cannot predict the machine's behavior, which increases the need for this kind of, um, of legal safety to be established. Some, some way of meeting the problem of, of uh, liability. Uh, there was an alternative proposal being developed by other lawyers in the European Union uh, that took a more human-centric approach and was more, uh, much more critical was uh, composed of uh, more traditional lawyers, and they proposed that that uh, the legal frameworks that are used to implement uh, robotics in the European Union should be based on human centricity. Okay, so then uh, in our paper, I'm moving towards the end. Um, we we use the notion of the roadmap. This is this mainly refers to the strategic documents issued by the industry, which is used to strategically oper operationalize the imaginary of autonomous ro robots in society, and to to ascribe concrete steps towards their realization. So, especially they are trying to um, order the contributions of academic roboticists and of, um, of legal and ethical scholars in order to pursue their goal. Uh, the roadmap is also uh, used as a kind of common frame of reference to align the, the different contributions of, of actors from different practices um, and, and to try to integrate, to create some kind of common understanding, for instance, of what autonomy means. So, uh, so Roboticists and ethicists and lawyers would describe that so, at least some of them had taken part in a number of uh, meetings and workshops where they tried to reach some kind of common understanding of for how to understand uh, human and robotic autonomy. Uh, yeah, to large extents, I, I mean, I cannot go into that here, but to large extents, you see that that many of these gaps that are trying to be filled between robotics and society, between uh, academic uh, robotics and industrial robotics, all the technical gaps identified, um, they, are not really, they are not really filled as, as proposed. So that there is a number of technical failures or obstacles that still remain. So you could say this is a kind of um, failure of these networks to, to do as promised. Yet uh, what we see is that uh, in this kind of innovation networks, those kinds of problems are not necessarily used for uh, as arguments for abandoning um, the project, but rather it becomes an argument for further upscaling. You need more resources, you need to bring more actors into the uh, network um, so so that problems become itself an argument in in favor of upscaling of the effort 
So uh, focus, a quite narrow focus on technical problem solving serves to drive the search for solutions up the institutional hierarchy, all the way up to the European institutions and the making of this private-public partnership in uh, 2014. Okay, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna finish some of the impacts on the institutional level. So this is where we get to the political level, which I I haven't really talked about that much. Uh, but what we see is that with the coming of this private-public partnership, the framing and the shaping of robotics research ag agendas is um, is largely left left in the hands of industry. So so prior to this, what you would have. Uh, you would have experts working for the European Commission. They would also come from industry and, and academic uh, networks, but, but they would be operating largely independently from, from uh, an organized industrial agenda. Increasingly, since industry is supposed to also contribute to the research programs dealing with robotics and artificial intelligence at the European level, um, they are also um, they are also put in in charge of defining the research agendas themselves. So this is one major impact. And some of the the, the um, scientists that we that we interacted with they they lamented this. They said some told that they would have to carry out their projects that were defined in a certain way, and then they would have to sort of carry out their their private research interests on the side. So they had kind of operated in two different kinds of frames, the official one and the unofficial one, where they could carry on or out their research according to their own interests. Then you also see, um, I mean, the, um, uh, you see that there is increasingly emphasis, uh, especially at the, at the institutional levels of um, ethics, uh, the the um, implementation of privacy by design. Privacy should be built into the robotics applications. Uh, a governance approach called responsible research and innovation. Uh, things like that. So 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 at the same time as these innovation uh, projects are reaching the institutional political levels, there is a reverse requirement that innovation takes uh, on board some of these ethical. Uh, ethical codes of conduct, ethical principles, privacy, and so on. Um, all of this mixed in a proposal uh, that was put to the European Parliament. Um, no, it was proposed by the European Parliament in 2016, uh, where they actually proposed the introduction of electronic personhood for robots. Uh, so that means that that the, the developments that we observed in this green paper pushed by the industry uh, had found its way into a legislative proposal at the European level where it would um, possibly break with the, the human-centric frame of, of European constitutions. So this, this caused a lot of uh, controversy, a lot of people reacting to it, um, Kind of the the um, the, the labor movements in Europe, but also a lot of legal experts and people working in robotics, they composed an open letter to the European Commission, um, asking them to uh, and to the Parliament to refrain from this, from not taking this step of not ascribing. Uh, some kind of personhood to a machine. As they said, it's not necessary and it will break with main assumptions of, of our constitutions. Um, also, yeah, this is something uh, I'm finishing now. Uh, this is uh, something that I mentioned in, in the introduction. I mean, what what are the what are the similarities if if to to uh, energy transition and those kind of development similar developments? What is the learning from this kind of case that I've been uh, describing now, um, uh, and how is it relevant to to energy transition and especially then technological uh, and digital innovations in in the field of energy transitions? I mean, on a very broad level, we see. 
how innovation and digitalization is, is moving further up uh, the political agendas, right? Uh, and, and increasingly are being mobilized to, to uh, address major societal and ecological problems. So ro robots, for instance, could be used to clean up disaster areas. They can also be used to, to care for, for the elderly. And, and, and there is this perception that we are moving towards a society where there are too many elderly people and not enough people to care for them. So therefore we have to um, implement this kind of robotic innovation. So, um, but we see that at the European level, you have discussions now becoming very vocal, very articulated of, of Europe uh, having to establish for itself some kind of technological sovereignty. That means Europe should uh, also create, uh, well, I mean, Europe is a regulatory superpower, but it's not necessarily a technological superpower. So you need to have these, according to, according to um, main agendas, you need to have this, this very uh, strategic and coordinated um, innovation efforts that, uh, that you see in the case of robotics. And that, of course, you also see in the, in the, um, uh, in the turn towards digitalization of the electricity grid across Europe. So it's increasingly organized and it's complex and it's large scale innovation and it's moving closer to political agendas. On the other hand, you see that te technology developers and innovators increasingly have to take on board requirements for some kind of ethics implementation, uh, some kind of participatory um, projects to, to see what how citizens feel about uh, the innovation, the, 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 this kind of innovation, uh, and, and lawyers are being employed in very strategic ways as well. So we see also that main regulatory and democratic concepts such as autonomy, personhood, or indeed sustainability in the field of energy become caught up in such large scale process. And, and then the question is, do they still carry meaning and have social uh, agency and resonance with broader, broad, broader publics and communities. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Shetil. Um, that was an articulate presentation, and um, I feel like um, it's useful now to perhaps spend a few minutes just uh, drawing out some of the points that you've already touched upon. I have a, I have a small list, but perhaps there are others here who would like to speak as well. So feel free to jump in if anybody has a, a question. I see I went slightly over time. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so if, if others are thinking through the thoughts that have come up, I guess one thing I was struck by was how in the Epinet project you you really contextualized you put uh, innovation in terms of robotics into the context of not only society but also um, the environments through which that innovation is enabled and, and promoted and um, and I, I think you brought out several examples of the kinds of biases that are inherent in such an enterprise but i'd like to push you to kind of if you had to sum it up what would what kind of biases do we see because of this sort of private led nature of innovation on robotics in Europe? Mm. Um, well, I, I mean, I think the maybe the most basic thing, uh, when, when you put it in those terms, as we did here, when you contrast it also with what is going on in the legal and political institutions, uh, it's quite <clears throat> the underlying vision is of, of a new robotic society or a, a society driven by machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. It is basically machine-centric. It's a vision that focuses on, on the expansion of machines throughout society. And it's a way of seeing uh, society and societal problems through the lens, uh, not necessarily through the eyes of the robot itself, but th through the needs of of uh, these kinds of technologies so it's very uh, of course a very technology centric uh, way of seeing things and and then 
it runs into some resistance at the institutional level when they are trying to implement this and, and propose such a thing as electronic personhood. So, so I think this um, this tension is quite uh, predominant, and it brings out uh, some of the assumption main assumptions. Um, at work in these in these networks, I mean, it's very clear when when you when when you uh, define a legal or ethical problem as an obstacle or barrier, uh, I mean, it 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 comes almost basic. It comes out of almost directly out of robotics because what you try to do when you try to make a robot uh, operate in an environment is is to identify obstacles and to move around them. It's very literal, you know. It's a, it's a kind of direct extrapolation of of uh, of the world of the robot onto society but of course it becomes complicated in all kinds of ways so you don't you don't get this vision to be enacted as such yeah i was i was also struck um, sort of in continuation of that um on the the sectoral variance when when you're talking about robots in a sort of role of care work um that's that's ontologically different from if you're talking of robots in terms of autonomous vehicles and in Stavanger now we have these autonomous buses being trialed and driving around still with some human intervention um so so it kind of links with this idea of experimentation and regulatory sandboxes as almost like a mode of innovation but to what extent when when you think of robotics do you see that sectoral variance as as sort of having distinct tendencies is it could you could you characterize the tendency similarly for across sectors or are we seeing specific movements in the nature of what robotics is in society that that lead us to focus on particular sectors and perhaps to be more concerned about questions of personhood for instance yeah good good question i mean of course this this analysis is is at the quite um general high level of abstraction uh, because what we are looking at is mainly what you would call or what is called in Eurospeak enabling technology. So there are, I mean, many of these technologies being developed, um, for instance, artificial intelligence. I mean, it, it can be used for deep sea searches, right? For oil or it can be used for clearing up a disaster area. Some of, some of these algorithms could possibly also be used to looking after, for you looking after your grandmother or for detecting um, suspicious individuals in a public space. Um, so, I mean, it's quite, it's quite generic, this, this perspective that we're putting on it. If, if you would like to go into the different kinds of sectors, if, if you are a practicing roboticist, I mean, for instance, we, we, we interacted with a number of roboticists working in hospitals with autistic children. Uh, some of these machines are very good for, for, for teaching and perhaps treating children of autism because, because they don't get angry when you, they interact with them, they can play with them, they like, they like the machines, and they're quite predictable. Uh, so, so, I mean, they are used for all kinds of things, you know, uh, and each each area of application will be different. It will pose different requirements. So if you're an applied roboticist, you will be much more concerned about what is going on inside the clinic, you know, or, I mean, they are being used now increasingly for farming, for, for uh, forestry. So, so there are highly different kinds of uses and highly specialized areas as well. And if you want to try to think about the policy implications, they are usually quite different across these different domains. But for Europe, the, this with care and companionship has been quite central, also because the Americans are so strong in space and security. And I'm, I'm not sure where the Chinese are strong, but this was perceived as a kind of uh, possibility for Europe, also because we have this idea of the aging society. So this was quite important for for uh, uh, these networks that we studied. I think we have questions. Uh, 
I have a, I have um, a follow up uh, if there's uh, still silence. So sorry, that... we're this is actually like a really big topic and it's quite new to us. So we're we're kind of processing everything that you said. Um, but what immediately comes to mind for me, at least, uh, especially with the uh, internship that we just did with public procurement, because you do mention um, in your slide about the relationship be like for for robotics and AI to basically, you know, make its way into everyday life, there needs to be collaboration between the public and the private sector. Mm. Um, and you do mention like pre pre procurement um, commercialization. Um, we very briefly come across that, but the um, I guess my question would would be like, how would you convince I guess public authorities? For example, local municipalities um, to adopt more AI and robotics. When, in our experience so far uh, with our internship, very many are concerned with um, with safeguarding like their economy in terms of like job creation and job loss. So, so mm -hmm. I would think that a lot of the discussion around robotics would would be concerned with like how do you protect people's jobs from being replaced by by robots. So. Mm -hmm. um, like basically what what do you think on that front like how how would you push public authorities to to sort of like relieve those fears good question uh first of all i think this with the pri uh, public private uh, partnerships is uh, i mean that's a space to watch you know in all kinds of areas it's becoming um it's becoming or has become a main model of implementation or uh, I mean, for a lot of things, you know, also moving into the environmental ecological fields and so on, eco innovations of all kinds of um, uh, nature, you know, but as for your question, of course, that is, yeah, first of all, we didn't look at, at the issue of, of employment, you know, employability, I mean, you, the, the, um, the argument you hear all the time is that historically, some uh, some lines of work have been disrupted. They have they have become irrelevant. But uh, the machines always created new lines of work, right? And perhaps there is something to that because looking at looking at the, these networks, they are hugely complex. So just trying to implement one machine in a in a care home or something would probably take a lot of assistance from from human beings you know so maybe the machine takes over some of the heavy lifting and and then the the caregivers can concentrate on other tasks and also on operating the robot and so on so um i i think maybe there is some justice to this argument that that new jobs will also be created but i'm not convinced by it to to say the least i also think I mean, what we see now following the corona epidemic, you know, is massive um, influx into that we are becoming much more dependent on these digital systems, you know, in all walks of life. I mean, that's why we are here <laughs> as well. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a bit scared what will happen because, because um, uh, well, I, I think I think many industries are looking to automate an, a number of tasks, and and when you see that you can bypass the human operator, who may become ill and so on, I mean the, the robot won't catch the COVID, you know. So maybe it's a safer bet to to delegate the tasks to the machines. But then the final question: How do you convince public authorities? I think they are already convinced. This is the whole discourse of progress, you know. We already have accepted that we will have 5G networks, you know, we will have the Internet of Things. And if we don't, if we don't implement this, we will lose out in the global competition. We are already caught up in the race between China and the US. So, so a lot of people, um, and perhaps higher up they get in the hierarchy in the public institutions, they have no choice but to accept this this framework already. And we are already surrounded by digital gadgets of all kinds. And we are fascinated with them. So, and people already have, you know, they have robo cleaners and, and, and so, I mean, all kinds of toys, self-driving cars, many people are fascinated. So, I mean, these, these things will happen. <laughs> 
thank you yeah no i'm just thinking more like so far i think robotics has sort of been like complements to our life like to make our lives more convenient but it hasn't sort of pushed into that territory where it literally replaces us so i'm just wondering now like you know once you kind of get to that line like how's it going to go but yes thank you for uh for answering but, but where is that line it all depends on on how we imagine it to be there is no objective one there is no one objective line it depends on uh public fear for instance there is a whole history as i mentioned of people reacting to the robots so it is very ambiguous it could switch from fascination and, and admiration one day to to fear and 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 disruption uh, the next day you know i mean see how people are reacting now to 5g and 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 to some of these um, electricity grids so you have uh, to the smart meters that we studied, uh, Sid and I, uh, you have now social movements against this and, and they, will, they will actually destroy some of the masts and the, so there will be material disruption to some of these things. It's very hard to, to predict, you know, you cannot, <laughs> or at least I cannot. I was, I was tempted to bring up uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, The Ministry for the Future um, and, uh, and also Cory Doctorow's uh, um, commentary on it. But I, I see we're on the R. If there's any sort of closing questions, now's the time and we'll allow one more. Mm, I don't think there is much more time. I just wanted to say thank you. And it's a super interesting topic and definitely um worth the time to dig into it more so thank you very much for that presentation and the discussion thanks a lot thanks i appreciate it <laughs> well, thank you Shetel. we'll uh, close now but uh, really rich talk and lots to think about so thanks for taking the time out thank you